We're live. All right. Well, welcome, Mesa Public Schools community. Uh, my name is Andy Forless, and I am the very proud superintendent of Mesa Public Schools. And today I am joined by Associate Superintendent Holly Williams and our assistant, uh, area assistant superintendent for the Red uh, Mountain Skyline area, Dr. Randy Mallerwine. Uh, we are here to talk about a very popular question in our community. And that question has been, when are we going to return to five days of in-person instruction per week? And so that will be uh, the topic that we are going to share with you today. We've allocated about 30 minutes. We'll continue to watch uh, questions as they roll in. So let me uh, get us started by providing a little bit of background. So that very important question, what date are we going to return to five, person, five days of in-person instruction? Well, we believe that we have an incredibly strong and uh, plan to return to five days of in-person instruction using our modified methodologies that I'm gonna talk about on October 12th. Now there's some caveats to that. Uh, as you all know that we have been watching public health metrics very, very closely in the state, in the county, and right here in Mesa Public Schools. We made the decision that we were at 7% positivity rate that we began our transition from remote learning to two days of modified in-person learning. And you all know that those two days um, have strict safety protocols in place. Our what we are recommending is that we are moving from two days of modified in-person learning to five days on October 12th, but there's a big if. We will do that if our percent positivity rate is less than 6%, and we are still staying in the yellow zone um, for the county criteria for hybrid learning. So I'm gonna let that all sink in for you for just a little bit. And uh, as we have been studying this and as our leadership team has been uh, designing this transition from two to five days, this is the document that we've spent a lot of time with. And um, lovingly, you can see I carry this around in my purse all the time as we're making plans of what this looks like. So you will see that this yellow chart right here is the qualifications for hybrid learning. And up at the top is the definition for hybrid learning. So that definition that we call modified in-person is a hybrid model that by definition means that uh, we have school, we have children in our physical schools as well as in a distance learning plan. So currently, as we I've mentioned quite a few times today, we are in a two-day modified person model. That was allowed when we hit the 7% positivity rate. As we move to five below 6%, so in that 5% range, we will move to five days of modified in-person learning. What does that mean? That means that we need to uh, hit below 6% positivity for two consecutive weeks, and that will be our trigger to move our model on October 12th. So that's a lot of words. No, I'm repeating myself because I wanna make sure that it's understood within context. So that means that all of our safety protocols stay in place when we move to five days. That means that we will have um, health screenings that are happening at home, for our children as well as um, our employees will be completing health attestation. Both students and staff will be wearing uh, face coverings. We will not be allowing large groups. We will not be allowing field trips. So all of these, again, all of these check marks um, need to be in place. We know that our biggest struggle will be in the area of physical distancing. So that will be something that we will pay close attention to. We will be think, rethinking our learning spaces. The weather is getting nicer. When can we take learning outside? And how can we rethink the, the distancing of our children to the very best of our abilities? So that answers that very big question of when will this happen? Now let's also ask the other question. So what happens if we don't have less than 6% positivity for two consecutive weeks prior to October 12th? That means that we will stay in our current model and that's two days per week. So I'm sure lots of questions will be coming in and we'll continue to answer those. Uh, let's go with a question that we have um, here. 
if a student stays remote, can they participate in athletics and activities? Would you like to um, answer that one for us, Mrs. Williams? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Furlis. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, absolutely. A, stu a student who is remote may choose to participate in activities and athletics. They just need to contact their school and say that they'd like to be a part of that team or that activity. They will have to follow all the safety protocols, meaning they'll wear their masks, they'll maintain the physical distancing as possible, and they will um, complete the health uh, acknowledgement so that they do a health screening before they leave the house. And with many of our sports and our activities, that there's an extra step of health attestation when you get to the activity, just to make sure that our sports teams are staying safe. So absolutely, we encourage our remote students to stay active and engaged at their schools. And if they feel comfortable participating in those activities that, that um, make them uh, excited to be a part of our, our school community. So we've got a question about sports, and since you were just talking about, uh, actually we have a question about football, so you were just talking about sports, Mrs. Williams, um, when will football start? Football is going, so we haven't had our first competition yet. We are on track. If our metrics hold, we are on track to compete next week. So this week is uh, scrimmages. We see some inter squad scrimmages. Um, practices have been going on safely, um, doing really well with following safety protocols and making sure that our students are staying safe. So football uh, gets started October second is what we're anticipating, barring any change, dramatic change in the metrics, and we're not expecting that. Our other sports have already started. We've been doing golf and cross country this fall and this week we started volleyball and badminton so um, high school sports are alive and well and our teams are doing everything they can to make sure that our students stay safe um, and you can help us as community members we are limiting spectators we are allowing families to uh, pre-reserve tickets to come to these events but we are asking that our our community members who do come um, also follow our our safety protocols so that we can keep the competitions going by keeping our community healthy Excellent. Um, and we've got a question. Uh, this will go to you too, Mrs. Williams. How are we monitoring spread and what is our contact tracing uh, methodologies? You know, this is a new area for us and we are doing this very um, avidly and regularly. So um, the way that we're, we're doing it is we're employing lots of lots of great minds around this work. So the, our first line of defense, of course, are our school people and our amazing folks in our health offices, our nurses and our health assistants who are talking with families, talking with children. If they show symptoms, if they have um, if they need testing, they're giving those resources. So our first line of defense, of course, is our health offices. Um, um, if they have a suspected case or they have a positive case, um, there's a form they fill out that comes to my office and we have what we call a COVID tracking team. Um, uh, I have an assistant who helps with that and then other members of our human resources department and of course our health services department at the district level with our director Nadine Miller. Um, those, those reports come in to us. We keep it in a database and we track it by school, by location, by department, depending on the circumstance. And we make sure that we ask, there's a list of questions that the county have provided for us so that we're making sure that we're asking all the questions we need to know to be able to inform folks who may have come in contact. So the way it works is if we get a positive report, say we have a positive report at an elementary school. Our first question is, when was the last time the student was in attendance? If it's been a while, you know, outside of a 14 days, maybe they're a remote student, then the notifications don't need to be the same as if they were in class yesterday and students may have sat next to them. So that's some of our first questions. Um, the notification system involves um, specific notifications to the classroom of the, of the student or staff member imp impacted, and then a school-wide message for both the staff and the community so that everybody is aware. We also do, uh, we also um, dig into who's been in the building. So we go to the sign-in log and if we have um, operations folks who've been there doing jobs like painters or others, we make sure that we um, let operations department know, the leads over there know to contact their crews. The other thing that we do is we call in what we affectionately call germ busters. And I'm sure there's a much more technical term, so please forgive me, but uh, we make a call to our operations department Department to make sure that they have extra custodial support for a school that has a positive case so, so that they can have an extra an extra cleaning, um, uh, extra hands to do the cleaning that night. So those are all pieces of our contract tracing and the response that we have if we if we have positive cases. Thank you very much and I appreciate the team that is working so well. 
um, under your leadership to make sure that we are constantly um, refining our process and it's important for the, the community to know um, that Mrs. Williams and her team stay up on all of these metrics and have built amazing relationships, both at the Arizona Department of Health Services as well as Maricopa County. So uh, this is top of mind for us all of the time. I've got a question for you, Dr. Mallerwine. Here's a question coming in on um, what will remote learning look like after October 12th, assuming that we meet the metrics and we're ready to come back five days? What will that look like and will it still be teacher led or will it move to Mesa distance learning plan? Thank you, Dr. Forlis. Um, when we return, uh, remote learning will look very similar to what it looks now. We're going to still have the same expectations for live instruction. We do have um, at our high school level, we do have uh, some teachers doing um, live in person and remote at the same time. We're looking to kind of streamline that and really increase the the remote experience for our secondary students, um, but our elementaries will, will look very similar to they look today. We've got same expectations for the same amount of live instruction and same amount of um, asynchronous instruction. So it, we're looking to always improve the experience and always improve the quality. You know, we've only been doing it for about seven weeks and we're constantly monitoring that and looking to improve and produce a better product. But for parents that are in remote and students that are remote, you can expect very similar um, in the almost exact same um, environment, the exact same amount of live and asynchronous. So, you know, this, another good question is coming in around um, possible schedule changes. So, let me uh, read this question to you. So, I, I think this will go to you, Dr. Mallerwine. Can you speak to the possibility of schedule changes for remote students? Could this happen at the semester? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're, we're always looking to um, try and meet the needs of our community. Uh, there is a lot of complexity with scheduling. And so we did ask people to give us their uh, semester one choice. And we've kind of asked parents in, in the community to understand that that may have to be their choice. But we're always working on a, on a case by case site basis if we can meet the needs because the needs change. Families um, have different health, health things that may shift. Somebody may may be modified in person and, and need to go back remotely for something that is unforeseen, and we wanted to accommodate that. Something may change health wise, and and the, and the student is ready to come back modified in person. If we can make that work, uh, principals are very motivated and have a sense of urgency to make that work. We're also going to be sending out a much earlier survey this time to get um, everybody's choice for second semester, so we can really make our schedules um, fit the needs of our community and fit the needs of our students. Uh, we're, you know, we're in a little bit of, um, you know, kind of moving as, as, as things change and, and we didn't, we didn't, we really didn't get the scheduling done that we would have liked to get done, but we did the best we could with the time we had to get, um, you know, our kids back in school like we wanted them to. So if, if you're looking to change at the quarter break, that is going to be, um, you know, up to the principal and the complexity of their site level schedules because they're so different from site to site, from elementary all the way to high school. But then we'll be looking for a survey to come out much earlier. This time, hopefully, uh, we'll get it out by the end of October, and that will be your second semester choice. And we'll be working diligently to meet the needs and the request of all our families and all our students. Yeah, I think that's really important to know uh, when Dr. Mallerwine talks about the complexities of the schedule, uh, principals are going to start working, um, have already started working on what this is going to look like. And so they're doing um, very sophisticated uh, matching of numbers of students to teachers. And so um, requests outside of that may not be able to be honored because of those, those tight matches. So please be understanding uh, as, as we continue to roll through this transition. Um, so let's talk about playgrounds. Uh, Dr. Mallerwein, I'm going to lean on you again about playgrounds. So um, kids want to get on the playgrounds. Can you talk a little bit about that and, and what the direction is to our principals after our week one of learning? Of course. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Um, we wanted to get our first week back. And we wanted to make sure that we could meet the safety protocols um, to get to get our students in school. After the first week, we, we really had a conversation with our elementary school principals because we knew we wanted to get kids social and get them back out on the playground. So we're looking, we've each school now, um, they, schools have different playgrounds and different facilities and different size areas for kids. And so we really have left it again 
back to the principals to try and create a safety plan so they can safely physically distance students and also get equipment um, sprayed down and cleaned as, as often as they can to produce the, you know, the safest environment possible. So playgrounds are opening up. Some are some have opened up faster than others, but we want to make sure that we don't compromise the safety with opening something up a little faster than we need to. Again, if you have a question about your site, that that again that can be directed to the to leader at, at that school um, for more specifics. But you know, some some schools got jungle gyms and swings. Some schools it's more of a big open place with balls. We want to keep um. All the equipment clean as we can. We want to keep the facilities as clean as we can. We want to keep the the outdoor space as safe as possible. So that's that's always our, our most important thing. All kids will be washing hands or using sanitizer before they head out, and when they when they um, get back in the building afterward. So that that's kind of where we're at with that. We're doing the best we can. So, Mrs. Williams, you want to talk a little bit about our next question? Um, will modified two day be available when we go to the five day model? Oh, thank you for that. That's a great question. And the answer to that is no. Uh, when we transition from uh, a modified two day to modified five day, the modified two day model goes away for many, many reasons. The continue, um, the continuation of the teaching and learning is, a, is one of the biggest and most important reasons why that needs to go away. The idea that our students, um, once they're face to face, um, they are, uh, accessing their teacher every day and um, the teachers will be planning for a five day lesson as opposed to right now they teach in face face to face every other day and so to to plan for basically three models in some cases would be um, it nearly impossible and the students wouldn't be getting the experience that they need to um, to access the learning so so two day goes away five day takes its place and uh, remote will of course stay in place um, throughout the school year uh, so, uh, Dr. Mellerwine, can you talk about the on-site centers? Uh, you know that uh, under the governor's executive order that we are to provide on-site uh, support centers at our schools for our children who are in a remote environment. What will that look like when we come back if we can hit those benchmarks on October 12th and we're back five days? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Flores. Um, if the benchmarks are met and we do return to five day, Every school will continue to operate with an on-site center. Uh, we will be making sure that the space is, um, is they're available. We can socially distance the kids. The number of kids that we a space can fill might change slightly because obviously we're going to have kids and more teachers back in the buildings on on more days. But the, every school will continue to have an on-site center for the kids that are remote for those days um, that they need a safe, uh, quiet environment to get internet. Um, and stay cool and, and, and stay safe. So every school will continue to have an on-site center, just in, in pretty much exactly how they're doing now. It's a registration process. And uh, so make sure that you reach out to get students registered if you are in that remote environment and you need that type of um, support and service for your children. Okay, sports, let's talk this time about junior high sports. You wanna talk about that, Mrs. Williams? When are we going to start junior high sports? We don't have a start date for junior high sports yet. We're still on pause for junior high sports as we uh, look for the transition and, and see what we can do. Typically, we try to model it based on um, what the high schools can do and the AIA has put some pretty strict guidance on um, sports and how they can uh, um, operate and we're doing well with them so far. So I will tell you that um, our athletic director and our um, coordinator of junior high sports are talking about what does that look like, but currently we are still on pause for junior high sports. So stay tuned. We should have some more information probably after October break about what's next. All right, we've, uh, sticking with the theme of junior high, we've got a, a question about schedules. I'll send this one over to Dr. Mallerwine. Will junior high schedules change again for remote slash in-person after October 12th? Thank you. Um, junior high schedules will remain the same um, after October 12th. Now, again, how I answered the question earlier, if, one, if your situation changes at home, we will do everything we can to meet the needs for your, 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 your child or, and your family. But the schedules at our junior highs will stay the same. And we'll be looking for that survey to come out because schedules will then be uh, modified for second semester as we 
we we possibly our numbers could change of modified in person um, our numbers could change for remote and also we want to try and learn from what what has happened first semester and try and create the best learning environment for everyone so you can really look for those schedules to be very similar the same uh, unless you, you you make a phone call and ask and look for those schedules to, to change after semester break and you know, Dr. Malawain, I think uh, to, to this question and to your point that there may be a teacher change because there may be a, a change in saying uh, there might be a shift of which maybe a teacher is going to teach uh, more of the remote sections based on numbers at a school. So there could be um, some changes, but structurally, we're not anticipating a significant number of changes. But you know, school by school, we are a large district, and so we have to, we know that that could be a possibility. Um, so there's a question and I'll take this one. What safety protocols will be in place when we go to the five day model? So again, I'll show you my, my trusty chart here. And by the way, um, all families are receiving a communication. It is in your inbox. It is being sent to your inbox right now that explains everything that I'm talking about, including a link to this chart. So you'll be able to see it. So when we are in that hybrid or that modified in-person model, that means that we have hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette. That means we have enhanced cleaning, uh, monitor absenteeism, that we do symptom screening, we're paying attention to ventilation, um, we're physically distancing to the best of our ability, that uh, students and staff are wearing masks, uh, that we are cohorting and putting kids into groups the very best that we can, field trips and large gatherings are canceled, and communal spaces are closed. So that is all part of the safety plans that will continue to be in place while we're still living in this yellow. It's very important to know that when you move up to the green, which would be called that traditional five day model, that means that all of the kids would be in, in physical buildings. That is not our plan because our metrics do not allow that. Our metrics only allow for us to be in the hybrid model and adhering to the safety protocols that I just mentioned. Um, I think that answers another question that is coming up as well. Um, so thinking about um, thinking about this transition from um, from the two day modified in person to the to the five day modified in person model uh, brings up some some angst for families. Uh, is there any words of wisdom that you could share with families? We'll go with Mrs. Williams and then on to Dr. Mallerwine. Um, how would you help families think about this? You know, I think that um, all decisions made during a pandemic are difficult decisions uh, for your families. It, it, you know, none of this is easy for any of us. And so making the best decision for your children is is what you're going to do. And 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 so I'd like to tell you, you can't make a wrong decision because it's, be it's what's best for your children. What we what we know and what we've seen from our experience so far with the modified in person two day is that many of our classes, not all of them, but many of them are quite small. And so even when we put the A and B day together, our numbers will be smaller than, than typical in many of our locations, not all, but many of our locations. I will tell you that our teachers are committed to um, helping with the physical distancing, with the hand washing techniques. I've heard hand washing songs, hand washing schedules. Um, they and they share with us the, the the remarkableness of the students and the way that they're willing to wear their masks and how careful they are with their masks. And so all of the things that we know through the through the um, county health officials have shared with us that will help keep our children safe are happening in our buildings. And so. I would say to you, if you feel comfortable sending your students to the two day, um, that you should ask, you know, how many students are in the class um, and then and then decide as a family, are you comfortable with moving to the five day when you know that both groups will be together? I think most of you will answer yes, because it is going to be a great learning opportunity and the students will be back together with their classmates and um, experiencing um, their school in the way that they seems more familiar than what they've experienced for the past six months. So. Um, know that we don't think you can make a wrong decision, though, though, because these are difficult decisions and you're only going to make the decision that's best for your family. That's my advice. Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> words of advice. We've had uh, words of advice and thoughts from uh, Mrs. Williams. Anything you'd like to add, Dr. Mallory? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Forrest. I, I learned a long time ago not to give advice on parenting. You know, that's a very <laughs> thing, and I, I want to honor. 
I want to honor every parent's decision, much like Ms. Williams said. And, and on top of the fact that we are going to, we are very conscious and very, very um, motivated to create the safest possible environment. We are constantly looking to improve our instructional model, not not weekly, but daily. Te teachers are are beginning to collaborate at a high level. We're, we're, we're moving forward with our teaching and learning department and, and trying to increase um, the quality of the instruction. I, I would ask parents to, to remember that, you know, we're going through this um, and we're not, we've never been here before. And Mason Public Schools is, is, a, is a lot of educators and people that really care and are doing what's best for our students instructionally. Uh, the model may, may not be um, to the expectations of you individually. I know we've heard different things. A lot of parents are very happy, but for those that aren't, we, I want to ensure you personally that we are working with principals daily. Principals are working with teachers daily and teachers are, are really holding themselves to a very high standard right now. And it's, and it, you know, it's, it's encouraging to see how our staff has responded and we're going to continue to improve daily, continue to improve weekly, and we're going to produce the best possible instructional model. But like Ms. Williams said, whether that instructional model is remote or modified in person, we're going to be focusing on improving both of those models simultaneously as the year goes on, because we know we are going to have remote students for the rest of the year, and we're going to have in-person students for the rest of the year. We know that's the case. So my advice would be um, hang in there. You're getting the best possible education um, that can be produced, and we're going to increase and get better daily. I mean, I know we're committed to that. I know Dr. Forlis and superintendency, our teachers, our principals, everybody is very committed to that. Thank you both. Um, so here's an important question. What is the drop dead date we will know if we are starting five days on October 12th? So let me talk you through that just a little bit. Um, Thursday mornings at nine o'clock are a really important day um, for our leadership team. That's when the metrics are updated from Maricopa County. And so right at nine o'clock, we are on that website checking to see where Mesa Public Schools um, is fitting within the metrics. What is our most recent data? So tomorrow, the 24th, we will be monitoring. If we are 6% or lower, we know that last week was 5.12%. That means last week, this week is our two weeks of consecutive um, uh, below 6%. So we will feel confident moving on. We also will be monitoring on October 1st. That is the Thursday before uh, fall break. So we will be making sure we're watching that data as well. The last date, for some reason, if our data is not below 6% on October 1st, um, we are going to, that gives us an opportunity to say, okay, we had the 20, uh, that we had last Thursday, we have this Thursday coming up, we've got the first, we're going to be good to go. For some reason, if our data doesn't hit tomorrow, that means we have October 1st and we have October 8th. Not ideal that we're on fall break over October 8th, which is when we would have to communicate to our communities. Yes, we're going. No, we're not. So in the best case scenario is that we will be communicating with you before fall break that we will be coming back on the 12th. But if there's an, anomal an anomaly that happens within the data that says that our second week is on October 8th, we will have to be, that would be our drop dead, the last date that we would be able to communicate to you that we would be going to um, the five day modified in person on October 1st. So it'll be important to watch email. Um, you know, all of the ways that we uh, contact you through text messaging. If, te if that doesn't go through, then we get you by phone and so on. So. Um, many of you get multiple um, indications of our communication out, but that is very intentional on our part. Um, I'm looking at questions and it seems like, you know, there's a lot of comments and a lot of feelings, um, disagreements, agreements that are going on about, is this the right decision? Um, I will tell you that um, moving to, from two days to, a, to five days based on public health metrics is the right best decision for Mesa Public Schools at this time. Um, we've got a strong leadership team. We, as uh, Mrs. Williams and Dr. Mallerwine have talked about, we have strong principals at our schools and we have dedicated and very creative teachers. So we are, we are not taking this lightly. We know the incredible undertaking that uh, this will require of our staff and uh, the big decisions that are being made by our families. Uh, this is not taken lightly at all. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to communicate with you. Uh, as I mentioned, there's detailed information in your email inboxes. Um, I just got an email and a text message during this call that all the information is on its way. So um, feel free to reach out with additional questions. Your principals are amazing sources of information. Um, and then we also have our email address at reopen that is part of the communication if you have additional questions that, that either we were not able to answer, didn't get to today, or things that come up. But um, please know that um, our best interest is in serving our children and providing safe learning environments for them. And we are doing everything that we can in Mesa Public Schools to create choice for our families as well as safety for our children. So um, looks to me like we have gone that um, we are at our 432 mark. Uh, any last words, uh, Mrs. Williams or Dr. Mallerwine that you'd like to share with our community? You know, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank the parents for their their patience and their grace as we navigate this brand new learning um, uh, environment for our children. Uh, this is new for all of us. We we joke about uh, we all feel like first year teachers, principals, leaders, because we don't we can't rely on oh during the last pandemic this is what we did. There's never been yes. a pandemic before. So 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 together we have worked collaboratively to try to solve the challenges that we've been faced with and. As as uh, Dr. Malarine said earlier, um, everything hasn't been perfect, but I will tell you that I feel like we get better at it every day and we continually look at our processes. So my last message is thank you. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you for your patience and your grace. Dr. Malarine, okay. you want to take a bell on our session? Yeah, just um, a lot of what Ms. Williams said, we, we really appreciate the community. I mean, we do have a lot of, um, there's a lot of feeling out there and there's a lot of emotion, but we also have gotten quite a bit of uh, thank yous and, and appreciation. And so we appreciate that. I can tell you when we pull our general administrator meeting together, you know, that's 200 of the most dedicated leaders that really care about the teachers. Uh, last week um, and this week, our teachers are, are figuring it out. They're, they're highly skilled, they're getting better. And I think, you know, I think the future is very bright for Mesa and we'd, we'd ask you guys to believe in us. We believe in you and, and we're going to do this together and we're going to come together as the city of Mesa, come together as Mesa Public Schools and uh, create the right environment and, and get through this, this pandemic and, and on to what comes next very soon. So just, just thank you for that. And thank you both for uh, spending time with us this afternoon, uh, providing this Facebook live event. And again, to our community, to our teachers, um, thank you. We appreciate you and we appreciate the patience that you are, are extending to us as we are making difficult decisions every day. So enjoy your evening. And if you've got any questions and gosh, if you've got great ideas and suggestions for us, send it back, send it right to that email address at reopenmpsaz.org. Um, thank you again. Um, bye guys, we'll see you soon. <laughs>